your seed is raising up someone to sow money into you. Your seed is raising up someone to sow money into you. And not only one person, but many people. How Jesus was explaining to the disciples, he was training them how to walk in the soul and anointing. And he was telling them that men shall give into their bosom. And men is a term that's dealing with more than one person. So Jesus was even dealing with a terminology saying that there'll be more than one person that is inside of your seed. Now, saints, I, 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 want, I want you to hear me very clearly. I have created people on earth. You say how? How? Because I use my seed. which is my sperm. So Zendaya Glory Holmes is a product of my creation. She is my sperm manifested. But I had this same sperm when I was five. But the sperm never came back in the form of Zendaya until I sold it. <laughs> If I never sold it, I was never going to see Zendaya. Meanwhile, I have plenty more other people inside of me right now. That if I sow, there'll be more people that you see appear. This is the mystery of the seed. That people are in the seed. When Jesus was telling his disciples, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. These men was in the seed that they was given. So if they didn't give no seed, they're not going to meet those men. Now, I, I, I never taught this before. The disciples were sowing seed in the Gospels. And now we see the men in Acts. Wow. Wow. Saints, did you catch this? The disciples were sowing Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. But when we go into Acts, now we see the men that was in the seed. Whoa. <laughs> it says, I, I, I hope you're listening to me. Listen to me. Listen, listen. Watch, watch. You, you can't miss this because it's right there in the scripture. Oh, this is so powerful. This is so powerful. You know, you know, I'm telling you, the glory of God is so amazing right now. There's an explosion of provision happening in your life right now. You should say that. There's an explosion of provision happening in my life right now. The Lord is multiplying me right now. The Lord is increasing me more and more right now. Say, Lord, I thank you for increasing me more and more. Say, Lord, thank you for blessing me and overtaking me with your goodness. Your goodness and mercy is following me. Thank you right now. The disciples were sowing. In the Gospels. But now they're reaping in Acts. The men was in the seeds that they were sowing into Jesus. And because they endured to the end, they did not get weary. Due season happened to the apostles. These same men that Jesus was doing sowing sessions with. He was engrafting them 
into the sowing anointing. He was training them to flow in seed grace, seed glory, seed wisdom, seed understanding. The saints, if you take it, let's write that down. Seed understanding. This is where you get to comprehend the favor that's attached to seeds that you sow. And favor means that you are now given tickets, access, VIP, into the privacy of God's power and provision and person. Whoa. Having VIP access to God's provision, his power, his person. Whoa. Now you understand why sowers are very close to the Lord. Now, oh my gosh, I have never said this like this. But I got to say it like how the Lord is saying it. A person could sow and still not think highly of themselves as if they're close to the Lord. But God's reaction to them reveals their proximity. Now watch this. The reason why God will rebuke a sower because even though you didn't feel it, you right in his face. God would chasten a sower. He'll knock you out. He'll bruise you with life. Those he loves, he corrects and chastens. Because you right in his face. You may not feel it. You may not sense it. But you right before the throne of God with the activity of sowing. See, that's why when you are sower, you can't take days off with seeking God. You can't say, yesterday I was a good girl, I was a good boy, so today I ain't got to pray as much. Today I ain't got to praise as much. You got to keep the regiment of thanksgiving and rejoicing and praise and continuance and obedience because you're right in God's face. So when you decide you want to flirt with somebody, God don't want you to flirt with them, and you're up there doing all that bullshit in front of God's face, he up there watching you. That's why people that sow, you might not live long. If you cross God, you might not live long. You can't tell me now, I've seen this happen. I've seen sowers die prematurely. You know why? Because they didn't recognize they was in God's face. And God was watching. You say, well, why that wicked man that killed folk? Why he not dead? He wasn't in God's face. His activity didn't lead him to the throne of God with God watching him closely. No, when you are sore, you might die prematurely. You say, prophet, show me that in the scripture. Let's go to Matthew 25. I, throughout the course of my life, not only in my own ministry, I know of another apostle. He had, and I ain't going to talk too strong on it because um, I don't want some of y'all to start trying to go investigate and try to find stuff out because some of y'all like that. Well, as soon as I say something, then your nosy ass, you know, all over trying to find out what, what I'm talking about. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You don't know what I'm talking about. There was another apostle. He had a sower that he raised up in his ministry. And the sower died. All of a sudden. Out of nowhere. See, when you are sore, you're right in God's face. The activity is what God is enthusiastic about. Because a sower is somebody that say, Lord, I'm not like everybody else. I want to give to you. 
Everybody else is taken from you, Lord. They take your life. They take your goodness. They take your mercy. They take your, your love. They take all the things that you give them, a body on earth. But I want to give. You're not going to find a whole multitude of people like that. So when you become that, God watches you closely. Was not Jesus at that altar place looking at the people placing money inside of the service? Why was Jesus standing over the money? Jesus was over there looking to see who wanted to take care of him. Jesus did not want to stand over there where people were singing, Hosanna forever, we worship you. Hosanna forever, we worship you. Hosanna forever. Hosanna forever and ever. He was not standing over them. He wasn't standing over the haka chaka the haka chaka 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 nu chaka nu. He was standing over people that had a heart to take care of him. Now this the same Jesus that many people think they get into heaven on, and and this same Jesus showed throughout the word where his cares was and where his focus was, and where his pleasures was. This same Jesus was real blunt and showing you what he loved. There was no hidden agenda. You didn't have to figure him out. He let you, when they, okay, here's Jesus, the miracle worker. Why are you standing over here with the money moving? Why? Why are you standing over here with people that purpose in their heart to sow? Why? Why are you not over here where the prayer warriors at? The praise dancers at? The choir singers at? Why are you not even over here where the preacher at? Why are you over here where the people are sowing out of their honor? Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Look at this here. Look what the words say. In verse 20, 25, uh, Matthew 25, verse 25. The non-sower said this, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. This nigga right here think that he, Napoleon Dynamite. I don't know, thou there Thou hast is dying. You know, this, this nigga was a little stupid. Okay, verse 26. Look at this. It said that his Lord answered and said unto him, Look, thou wicked and slothful servant. Look at what the Lord is saying. Thou wicked and slothful servant. Look at the address that God steps on a person that doesn't think about sowing into him. So when we often meet people in life, we hear about their troubles. We don't hear about their wickedness and slowfulness. We don't hear about their non-caring heart towards the Lord. We hear about their troubles, what's going bad for them. We don't hear about their hard heart, their rejection of God's system, their inconsistency with God's system. We hear about the problems they're facing. We don't hear about how they don't live a life to impress the face of God. 
We just hear about the problems they face it. Look what the word said right here. Thou wicked and slothful servant. Now let's go to verse 27. Thou artist therefore have pit my money to the exchangers. I told you seed sowing is an exchange. Didn't I teach that yesterday? I taught that yesterday. Here Jesus was teaching the same doctrine to the people in his day. In that day. He said, you artists have put my money to the exchanges. Seed sowing is an exchange. You're not giving to lose. You're giving to gain. There's something on the other side of each seed you sow. And every seed is not carrying the same level of sincerity. And let's talk deep in here. There are some seeds you sow that's not sincere. Because the mental place where you sowed it, you're not even so much thinking about the Lord. You're just like, hey, I, I know, I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. It's not sincere. <laughs> sincere sowing is when you receive that grace. You can relax. You can adapt to the pressure of the power of God to sow. Because the power of God to sow put pressure on you. You can't tell me nothing. There have been times I was about to go mail a seed to Dr. Mike Murdoch. Then I had to go to Cash App and say, I picked the seed in Cash App. Because I, 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 there's too much stuff that I'm doing. And at the same time, I'm not going to let the enemy stop what I purpose in my heart to do. Because time will eat the sown anointing. The information, and you say, prophet, how could it, something eat the anointing? Because the, it, remember I told you anointing is information. The information that you have to sow start dying off. That's what happens. That's what happens. When I say it eats off the anointing, now that information that you have to give, you start losing the excitement. You start becoming natural again. Your faith start declining. Your expectations start disappearing. Your energy start subsiding. You're not in the focus to sow no more. Something else done intercepted the focus. Something else has become your priority. So the idea to sow is dying. When God give you the flow to sow, sow the flow. If you take a note, write that down. When God give you The flow to sow, sow the flow. Man, that's something else. If you think about it, when God give you the flow to sow, sow the flow. If you don't sow the flow, you harbor that flow, it dies in its reality. Wow. You could have something from God and the reality of you having it is no longer apparent or potent in your soul. You got it, but you, let me, let me, let, let me ask you this. How many times did you have something in your pocket and you didn't feel it? That's what happens with the sowing anointing. That's what happens with the reaping anointing. How many times did you look for your keys while it was in your pocket? You look for your wallet, it was in your pocket. You look for your remote control and it was right on the couch where you were sitting down. You were sitting on it. Don't think about it. You were sitting on it. <laughs> How many times have something been right in your view and you walked past it several times and said, where is it? 
and it was right in your view. Well, that's what happens with the seed. The seed sowing anointing is always nigh a person because this is the vocal purpose of why God made every person to have a heart to sow into him. This was the major reason why God made man. He made man to sow into him. So every time a person is living out in a day, there's an arena in that day where God is seeking to move them in to their purpose, which is to sow into him. Somehow. Now watch this, people of God. The seed is often rejected by people that have confidence in their own human ability. They believe even if I'm not working, I could scheme provision. <laughs> even if I don't know I'm going to get some money, I could find a way to scheme some money from somewhere. Not sowing leads to scheming. You ever seen somebody looking for money that don't sow money? That's a schemer. A sower is a dreamer. A non-sower is a schemer. Why are you expecting something that you've been robbing God with? Don't you believe it's a thief if they walk inside of a store and make no exchange at the cash register, but walk out? You'll say that person just stole something. Ah. But you expect to walk out with candy, blessing, security, protection, and you ain't making no exchanges. Wow. A schemer is a non-sower that still has the expectation of a sower. That's deep. I said a schemer is a non-sower that has the expectation of a sower. So while you believe in God for a house, they believe in God for a house too. In their mind, it's all an illusion. If you saw a man that never fed his wife, if you saw a man that never did nothing special for his wife, and his wife even told you, um, he has never bought me anything. Uh, he don't he don't give to me, but we love each other. You know, he, he, he has never done anything for me. I never seen him buy anything. I never seen him feed me. He never gave me water. He never gave me nothing. He never took care of me no way. But he loves me with all his heart. You would look at that woman and say, you stupid. But this is what the human race is doing to God, the Father. They're acting like God, the Father, is stupid. You're acting like you really love and fear God, and you don't even have no record of consistent investment into him. But you think that you could talk that sweet talk and talk about, I, I love the Lord since I was a little child. I fear God. I love him. He knows my heart. The heart that never acted on a thought to bless him. He knows my heart. Did you notice that all wicked people always saying that God knows their heart? And their heart evil and wicked and dishonorable? And they take pride in that statement. God knows my heart. Look what proceed out of your heart. You're not the way that God made Adam. You don't think like how God made Adam to think. 
What is God knowing in your heart? He knowing selfishness, blindness, deceitfulness, wickedness, love for the world, love for the flesh, love for sin, love for carnality, strife, bitterness, pride, ego, arrogance, impatience, anxiety, jealousy, covetousness. Why they got it? I don't got it. He knows my heart. Inconsistency, unfaithfulness, disrespectfulness, self-deception. He knows my heart. People that say that God knows their heart be the most cruel people on earth. That become their statement of comfort. And then saints, have you ever met those wicked people that act like God is, is their friend because you recognize their wickedness? They'll act like God is their friend and that's all they need. All I got is God. That's all I need. You're trying to make it like the Holy Ghost is cohabiting, cohabitating with you. While you don't do nothing that's led of the spirit. And when somebody recognizes that you're not led of the spirit, now it's you and God and that's all you need. Thou wicked and slowful servant. This is the title of a non-sower. They wicked and slowful. Now you notice the Bible said that servant, meaning the seed is meant to serve God. How you think that serving God is you sitting in a pew and you up there singing to people that say that they love the Lord. That's what you think servanthood is. You think that it's preaching. You think that it's up there. Or if I go on conferences, if somebody up there invite me to speak, you know, if I go sing somewhere, if I go have a Bible study. Here the Bible is revealing that this man was called into servanthood, but the servanthood was to sow. So this was the services that God had anointed him to offer. And he rejected the ministry. Do you know what my major calling is? A sower. Do you know what my major mission in life is? Why I was sent to the earth to be a sower. Me, Prophet Joshua Holmes. A sower soweth the word. Some on stony ground. But then some is on good ground. And it reap a harvest 30, 60, 100 fold. That's the person that receives the word. Now, you notice that the word talked about that um, in Mark 4, that there are levels to the reaping, 30, 60, 100. A lot of people don't reap 100, but you reap 30, and some of you all could identify with this. You're not fully in what I've been teaching you all these years, but you somewhere in the equation. That's 30. This deep, this deep. What I just said to you is deep. And I just gave you a lot of understanding. Some are in 60. A few are in hundred. Thou wicked and slowful servant. So 
This man was created to sow. If I had a prophet, Joshua Holmes, and I followed him for years, boy. I'll be gone. And I mean that I'll, I'll be I'll be roaring in the spirit. I'll be high. See, the sowing anointing, it, it, it is so powerful because you could judge yourself when you look at it. You, you don't even have to wait for God to judge you. You can look at yourself and say, well, how am I sowing? Okay, so how am I spending my time? How am I making my decisions? How am I up there buying stuff that take away my seed sowing ability? I ain't even fulfilled the seed, but I thought myself was worthy to acquire this and acquire that. And now I find myself, I can't sow because I'm handling that. But look at my priority. So I'm pitting my comfort into something that can't deliver me from cancer. It can't deliver me from hellfire. It can't deliver me from eternal judgment. I'm pitting my faith, my hope, my time, my comfort into something that's not going to be here a thousand years from now. And a thousand years from now, I'm going to need this God to work on my behalf and have me in his presence. Ha! Ah. Ha! Ah. You notice when you eat food in 24 hours, in 12 hours, for some of y'all in three minutes. You hungry again. But how many times do you take money and buy the food? You buy stuff that don't even got a long lasting effect. But you want the one that's eternal to stand on your behalf at the end of your life. And this is the one that you ignored. You made everything else about you. But now you need him. And why can't you call up that food that you paid for and say, could you get me into heaven? Why you don't call up your car insurance? Why you don't call up your vehicles? Why you don't call up your house note, your mortgage, your apartment? Pay? Why you don't call that up? Why you don't call it up and say, hey, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. Hey, could you help me out? I'm trying to get into eternal life. I'm trying to live forever. I'm trying to escape hellfire. Hey, 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 Chili, Philly Cheese State, could you set me free? Philly Cheese State, could you set me free? Philly Cheese State. Philly Cheese State. Imagine people invest into things that can't deliver them 200 years from now. And it's funny that you could find a way to put your trust in those things today and not in the living God that you're going to need when you're not in this body no more. Isn't that wild that you could live a whole life investing money? Everywhere except the Lord. And that's who you're going to need. When your life is no more in this body. Just think about this. 300 years from now. Can any of the meals you ate today could deliver you? Could you be in hell and say, uh, Big Mac. I'm calling you. Could you set me free? I'm going to burn up in this fire. You can't. Could you say, hey, smoothie. Uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 I drank you. Could you help me? Hey, hey, could you call the car insurance man? Hey, hey Mr. Car insurance man. Yeah, yeah, I was paying you monthly, every month. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, could, could you set me free? I'm, I'm up here burning this flame. Uh-huh. Yeah. You can't eat? Oh, oh, you burning in the flame too? Oh. And it's funny that all of the investments of one's life 
is in things that they prioritize as a better soul than God. You made it a better soul than Jesus. But now you want Jesus to be your advocate in eternal life. But you spent your days where you could have showed your trust in Jesus and you place the trust in other things. Wow. Look, look what he said in verse 27. Matthew 25 verse 27. Thou artist therefore have picked my money. So the talent is money. And you see some people talk about talent as if it's ability to do things. Exactly. You see uh, shows that talk about your talent and they, they audition. Because even if you say a talent is an ability to do something, that ability to do something has money in it. But a talent is money. So even though you say, well, somebody's talent is to sing, but that singing is money. If, that, if that's their true talent from God, if that's the ability God gave them, you know, not because you can do something mean you're supposed to do it. I can play basketball, but I'm not going to the NBA. Unless, you know, that's, that's, you know, I can play basketball. Your ability to do something is not confirmation. I can do a lot of things. I have endurance. That don't mean that I'm going to go race. I have speed. I'm not going to go track star racing. Your ability to do something is not confirmation of a divine calling. If you take a note, write that down. Your ability to do something is not confirmation of a divine calling. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you're called to do it. Remember God. You're from him. So abilities can be learned. Many people train themselves to do stuff that will take them to hell. Your ability to do something is not confirmation of a divine calling or a divine purpose or a divine instruction. Everything that you can do, you're not instructed to do. If you take a note, write that down. Oh my God, my God. Look at verse 28. Take therefore the talent from him. And give it unto him which hath ten talents. Oh. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, listen. Verse 28 is crazy. It's divine. It's surgical. It's spiranious. Verse 28 says, take therefore the talent from him. You don't want to sow? Take the talent from him. Watch. And give it unto him which have 10 talents. So you look at somebody that's real rich and then you say, well, why they don't help somebody that's poor? That person need help. They don't need help. They're non sower Well, Jesus taught that this man, he didn't have as much as the one with the 10. But Jesus said, take what he got. I know he pulled now, but still take it and give it to the one that's extremely rich because this is the one with sewing hands. This is the one that I don't got to wait five months Wrestle with them. They're not hopping back into sin. Then 10, 10 months later, oh, I'm back to my senses now. So let me start sowing. You know, you know, I, I was in a relationship with a man. It didn't work out. So I'm back, Lord. I'm back, Lord, to sow. You know, you know, I ignored you. I didn't want to honor you. And now everything that I was doing done fell in the cracks. So here I am, Lord. I come to sow again. 
No, no, no. This man was sowing when he felt like having sex. He was sowing when he was horny. He was sowing when he was tempted. He was sowing when he had fear. When he had sowing when he was upset. He was sowing when he was rejected. Sowing when he had opposition. Sowing when he had attacks. Sowing when he had lack. Sowing when he had not enough. Sowing with adversity. Sowing with persecution. Sowing with attacks from every side. Sowing when he was neglected. Sowing when he was rejected. Sowing when he felt confused. Sowing when he didn't have energy. Sowing when he didn't have confirmation. Sowing and sowing and sowing. Go give it 